Okie dokie, let's kick off everybody. Put your phones to silent. Uh, thanks for joining us everybody. I'm Rajesh Merchandani, the Senior Director of Communication and Policy Outreach here at the Centre for Global Development. I'm delighted to welcome you here this afternoon. I'm particularly delighted to say hello to the Women's Leadership Group from George Washington University who've joined us here this afternoon. Very nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is going to be a really interesting event. We've called it Identity and the SDGs, how finding the missing millions can help achieve development goals. Let me just start off by asking you all a question. Hands up how many of you are carrying some form of identification? Which hands up? Right, pretty much everyone in this room. What would happen if you lost it? Say your passport or your driver's license or anything like that. What kind of how much of an inconvenience would it be? How much panic, how much frustration would you feel at not having that piece of ID? It's, it's an essential proof of identity for many of us here in the rich world. But now, imagine that you never had one. What are the things that you'd be prevented from doing? You know, you couldn't travel, you couldn't open a bank account, you couldn't, here in this country, you know, get a gym membership, get cable TV, sort of pretty frivolous things like that. But then there's the more serious spectrum of things that you'd be prevented from doing. Accessing education services, legal services, exercising your right to vote. That's how important it is to you. Suddenly you become disenfranchised, right? You can't take part in society. But what would happen if you never had a legal identity, if those things weren't even an option to you? Well, that would put you on a par with about two billion people, mainly in the developing world. That's almost a quarter of humanity. And in that number is included 600 million children who were never registered at birth. Now, Amartya Sen talked about the missing millions, but these are the missing hundreds of millions. And most of them are already amongst the poorest people on the planet. And they don't legally exist. What chance do they have in life? It is a huge obstacle to development. And the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, recognize this. There is a target for this, specifically target 16.9. By 2030, provide legal identity for all, including birth registration. But the fact is that identity is key to so many other SDG targets. It is a right in and of itself and a target in and of itself. But it's also an enabler to many other SDGs, and that's what we're going to hear about today. We have an illustrious panel lined up for you on the stage, including a couple of people who've been central to the negotiations around the SDGs. Let me introduce them to you. Starting from this end, Mahmoud Mokhieldin is the Corporate Secretary and President Special Envoy to the post-2015 process from the World Bank. Tony Pippa is the US Special Representative to the post-2015 process. Myra Buvenich, uh, a new senior fellow here at CGD and director of our just launched gender and development program, and Alan Gelb, a senior fellow at CGD, and he's going to be telling us all about his work on identity and the SDGs. We'll also see a video from Damendra Pradhan, who is India's Minister for Petroleum, uh, about how identification services have helped increase financial inclusion by turning fuel subsidies into individual cash transfers. Minister Pradhan is the minister who implemented this in India, and he came in a few months ago, and we sat down and recorded an interview with, uh, uh, with him, and we're going to play you a little bit about that. And then we'll get some comments on that later on as well. Speakers, I'm going to ask you each to keep your comments to about five minutes, uh, and then I'll ask some follow-up questions, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience. Um, I always like to welcome my panels with some applause, not exactly payment for performance, but an incentive to amaze. So if you wouldn't mind giving a round of applause now, that would be great. <laughs> okay, good applause means the pressure's on, panel. Uh, Mahmoud Mokhildin, um, please start us off. Paint the big picture. Why is ID important in the SDGs? as a right in itself or as something more? And how has this been reflected in intergovernmental negotiations around the post-2015 development agenda? All right, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great uh, honor for me to be uh, here with this uh, very distinguished panel and uh, with you all. And um, I'd just like to start by reacting to uh, your very interesting question at the beginning. 
what are you missing if you don't have an ID? I am an Egyptian from an Egyptian village and I spent some time studying at the UK. And in those two experiences, I had the following. As a villager, where everybody knows you, you don't need really to see any kind of a value of having an ID with you. Actually, if you see some seniors in a village, it could be an offense if you are asking them if they have an ID. Because in a village of perfect information, everybody knows you and you need very little from around you, especially related to access to anything from the formal system, you don't need it. And then when I uh, went to study in the UK in the 1980s, some of you may be familiar with this issue about uh, privacy or privacy and having an ID as an obligation could be really away from this before the big brother kind of interests that will be an issue of concern then. But in today's world, then th that was very much reflected in the SDGs and we are very, mu very much right about this ambitious target of many, 16.9, <laughs> that by 2030, everybody has to have some sort of an identification to assist them. And this is assumed to be for the benefit of the citizens of the world. With that big notion that we need uh, that big target to be fulfilled or an objective, leaving no one behind. So the issue is that everybody has to be accounted for. Everybody has to have the access to services, legal services, financial services. So it's an issue of right as well. And if you are going to be getting it from that perspective um, of technology that with the new ways of delivery that are very much linked to a system with many IT solutions there that are lowering the transaction cost, that are making many countries that have been lagging behind for ages with better access to services. And we see the wonders of IT in countries like Kenya and now in, in Tanzania, when you have all of these kind of, of services from financial access and now th uh, through the social protection uh, schemes through the use of mobile uh, technology that you can really identify what kind of benefits could be there. We are starting from a very um, a challenging uh, position. Uh, 2.4 billion people today lack official identification. 625 million children up to the age of 14, um, birth certificates have been never there, never registered. Of course, you can always challenge the accuracy of these numbers. 2.4 billion and 605 million are just estimates or could be in some circumstances guesstimates uh, because, because of lack of identification, we cannot identify the problem um, uh, prop uh, uh, properly. This is part of the bigger problem that we, we are challenging in development. Those of you who are involved in development, they know very well that we have very big problems when it comes, for instance, to uh, knowing the number of births in any country. Uh, or the percentage of women who, are, who could be poor, or uh, dealing with the fact that since 2009, we don't have an update um, on child mortality. 26% um, um, well, of, of countries, they do not really report on that regularly. So how, how can we deal with this, uh, with this issue? I can just go through very quickly what the World Bank is trying to do. We have um, launched an identification for development program, the ID4D program to address the SDG uh, challenge 16.9. Six, uh, uh, we have been engaging uh, with variety of organization, including UNICEF, WHO, uh, uh, the Economic and Social Commission for Asia, and with the civil society organizations and with think tanks, including our engagement today, I consider it one of the possibilities to get ideas on how to get matters better understood and to get ideas in for implementation with our presence today with the Center for Global Development. In July 2015, uh, in Addis, we, uh, with uh, Canada, uh, we started the platforms. Of the, um, this is basically a platform uh, for safe registration and vital statistics, CRVS. Um, it's called many people around are only comfortable when you see matters abbreviated, so you don't exist until you have this abbreviation. So CRVS uh, is there, and with the generous donation from Canada, which commit, uh, committed 16 million uh, for that work, uh, $16 million, and uh, we are starting to see some sort of good work uh, with Djibouti, one engaged with Morocco, 
and their delivery systems with Djibouti, we decided to broaden, the, they decided to broaden the scope of their uh, social welfare system and uh, they are engaged with us on that. And they are uh, one uh, or those are two of the beneficiaries of the ID4D. We are engaged as well with Kenya and I mentioned Kenya before because their platforms and the use of technology is giving us an example of an advantage of starting late. So they are uh, starting where everybody ended with the technology and dealing with the issues um, um, in, a, in a smart way. Uh, no, re no reinvention of wheels, uh, although that some people are happy doing that from time to time. It's a business of reinventing wheels in these areas. Um, however, then very quickly, I see you approaching me. <laughs> so um, um, what are the challenges then? So we have very big targets uh, with this with this program, including the inclusion of 375 million um, people who could be included in the financial system. Uh, we have estimated good savings through efficiency and good quality of delivery. Um, the estimate is around $50 billion um, uh, per annum by, by 2020. Uh, so this is a very big saving. If you are having better targeting schemes through better ID systems. And then uh, we have been working as well with some um, controversial areas here that um, because sometimes when you say, well, it looks a, a very good thing that everybody has to be accounted for and we, this is after targeting. But there are many beneficiaries of the status quo. So when we were working, for instance, in Nigeria, um, better reporting eliminated 43,000 ghost workers from payrolls. So while you are active doing these kind of things, don't get surprised that this could be challenged because many people are benefiting from the status quo, from the inefficiencies in the system, from the lack of ability to track uh, or targeting better your aid or your support, or as it's, uh, it's been very much revealed, there, there have been thousands of people getting, and not through the right means or the right causes, $67 million without really having the right to do that. So we need to be very, might, uh, very much mindful in that. Finally, there are two comments. Well, I'd like to put this context. We have very good experts around from the bank who can really answer the tough technical questions. But I'd like to put it within the context of the data revolution as well. Because this is part of the bigger issues of concern. While we are solving uh, this issue of identity, we are solving many issues <laughs> when it comes to education, when it comes to health and social protection. Uh, schemes And when it comes to the rights, many of us know this uh, uh, famous phrase by Confucius, uh, when words uh, miss their meaning or lose their meaning, people lose their freedom. But in our development agenda, when data lose their meaning, there is an issue of the very existence of people because you are simply not being accounted for. So without dramatizing the matter, we are dealing with a very important issue here and as I was telling colleagues in our way here for the, the discussion, while the challenges are huge, I'm very much uh, optimistic because of three things. First, there is a, a sense of collaboration that we can really get and complement each other in the achievement. Second, there is a very important role today for IT solutions that made it today easier with lower transaction costs than ever before. And third, there is a role as well for media, especially the social media, in making making these matters achieved easier and faster. Thank you. Okay, Mahmoud Mokhil, and thank you very much. Tony Pippa, um, you were involved in the intergovernment and intergovernmental negotiations, I can't even say the word, uh, around <laughs> the SDGs <laughs> earlier this year. I hope you had more <laughs> success in pronouncing it than I did. Um, uh, representing the US, give us the US's view of the importance of identification to development and what the US is going to do to help increase the number of people, that, that 600 million children and the 2 billion people who don't legally exist at the moment? So I think, um, uh, again, echoing some of the themes that, uh, that Mahmoud just talked about, that focus on leave no one behind, where we're focusing on the poorest and the hardest to reach first, really provides the basis, I think, for, um, for ensuring the success of this particular target. And when you think about this target, it's in some respects the quintessential SDG target because it brings in issues of, um, of governance, of rights, as you've talked about. Um, it, it, uh, it's also specific 
and clear, so it really provides um, a target that we can that well, we can get our hands around that's concrete and practical. Yet it also uh, shows the importance of integration across the agenda. And that's that's one thing that I think the SDGs were really really differ from the MDGs. You talked about how this particular target, for example, can have ripple effects or impact on many different places throughout the agenda. And I think we believe that strongly. Um, and we believed, you know, as we were working within the intergovernmental process, um, we put a strong value and focus on evidence and on data and what the best available data could show us around all the different things we were talking about um, in the agenda. And not having registration and not having that identity actually means you're missing a key building block from which you're basing that evidence and data on. And so, um, again, uh, Mahmoud echoing, you know, the data revolution being really important here. It's important for us uh, to be able to assess progress and to be able to ensure how we're doing on vital health statistics. We need to be able to have that key building block. And so I think it's something that um, we saw as, uh, as, as important. We also saw it as something that was clear, measurable, and achievable, um, and something that fit very well with the the focus on the, the addition of sort of strengthening institutions and effective and, and responsive governance um, that governments can, uh, can be providing to their citizens. Um, I would just say a, a, couple of, a couple of things about the challenges, though. Um, and, and one thing that's not in the target, I think we believe really strongly, and we would have loved still for it to be there. And, and that is for the legal identity to be universal, but also to be free. Um, and I think that's an important qualifier. Uh, because you don't want to create procedures that in, in some respect can impose a cost right. on the very poorest and act as a tax, in essence, on the poorest. And so any of the, um, any of the methodologies and approaches that we're talking about today, we ought to be keeping that in mind. How do we deliver this, but do we ensure that it's something that is free for the poorest that we're trying to reach and make sure that we have uh, registration? I think it's also important for us um, not to pursue this blindly, but to be very um, sensitive to potentially perverse consequences. I mean, we talk about this from a perspective of uh, vulnerable individuals accessing services or uh, establishing their rights. Then um, sometimes formal ID can compound if we haven't uh, addressed the underlying, um, the underlying or systematic discrimination that could be occurring, and we don't want there to be perverse consequences. So we have to ensure um, that we're addressing things that are, that are lying underneath. Um, I, I think the other challenge here is there is not just one size fits all solution. This is an issue that cuts across development uh, sectors, um, and the means by which to do this can be highly contextualized. Um, the opportunities for improvement will depend on different things in different countries and, and particular features. Um, is there a push for a centralized social safety net? Is it about universal health coverage? Are there upcoming elections? Each of these bring different parameters and, uh, and different things to bear, but provide the opportunity. Um, we've been, as we pursue this and, and we've been looking at it, I mean, we have been integrating issues of identity into our programming in different ways. Um, USAID, for example, has been doing healthcare improvement projects where they work with health ministries and community-based organizations. Um, we worked with one community partner organization in Kenya, for example, and found that 1,500 children in that community lacked birth registration, 200 of which were, were deemed vulnerable. And working through the provincial administration, we helped caregivers obtain the supporting documents and go through the registration, and in just one week, had registered over, uh, over 1,000 um, children and transmitted these to the registrar's office. Um, that's just one, uh, one example of how when we're looking at our particular programming, we're looking for ways in which we can integrate uh, registration or legal identification into that. What that does, though, is gets back to what Mahmoud was talking about. It makes the need for coordination that much uh, more important. Uh, because it's not just an initiative in and of itself, mm -hmm. but it's integrated into different ways in which we're, develop, we're delivering development. And I think that is both um, going to make it more complicated, uh, but it also provides us the opportunity to do it in many different contexts.
I'll leave it there. Okay, Tony, thank you very much indeed. Myra Buvenich, along with senior fellow at CGD, Charles Kenny, you're going to be leading our work on gender and development. And in your concurrent role at UN Foundation, you've also been focusing on gender and development. I would like you to talk a little bit about the importance of identity to gender equality, but also the importance of gender equality to identity. I think you've also got some new data to share with us as sure. well, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And yes, I am here very much today <coughs> with another hat. It's called the Data 2X hat. Uh, data 2X was started by Secretary Clinton in 2012, and it's really to improve the quality <laughs> and the availability of data on women and girls. Mm -hmm. And we immediately, vital statistics clearly are the basic building blocks for good data on women and girls. But not only that, once you have an identity, when, once you have an ID, that opens up opportunities for women and girls. It basically contributes to their e empowerment because with an ID, you can access the formal economy, you can vote, you can access bank, the banks, etc. So that's why Data2x, we started partnerships, and CRVS is one of the topics that we really wanted to work on. So we established two partnerships, one with the UN Economic Commission for Asia and the Pacific, ESCAP, and the other one with the, for, with the UN Economic Commission for Africa. And what I'm going to tell you today is data that just came out. I've just, you know, it's hot off the press, it's preliminary yet. But what we did with these two commissions is we said, well, before we decide how we're going to tackle this and what, what kind of a program and an action plan we're going to work with the commissions and the countries on CRBS, <coughs> let's see what the data says. Is there a gender gap in birth registrations, in IDs, or not? So we have been looking at DHS data, at household survey data for Asia and for Africa, and let me tell you sort of what we are finding out. The one thing that we knew from before, and this is data that the uh, Inter-American Development Bank has done, is that there is no real gender differences in registration of births or in under-registration of births. But what really matters is if you have mothers who are unwed. Mm. Or in consensual unions, there are large numbers of them in Latin America. These mothers tend to register their children much less often. Mm. So through that, you get the intergenerational transmission of poverty. You know, mothers who are unwed, they're usually teenage mothers. They don't register their children. Their children don't have birth registration. Mm. Then they cannot access a number of services. It now recently, and I think mm. this was a CGD-sponsored uh, uh, research, in Indonesia, the same thing. Mm. In Indonesia, a lot of women are in consensual unions. Large numbers of families where the women are in consensual unions don't register their children. There are laws. In some countries, there are laws that prohibit you to do that. In fact, for instance, in Nicaragua, the law says you have to have the father's signature for the registry of your child. So anyway, so that's what we used to know. But now let me tell you what happens in Asia. We just have data for 13 countries in Asia uh, from the DHS survey. And in fact, there is, again, there is no under-registration of births. There's no dif gender differential in under-registration of births. But we yet don't know, and we have to analyze further if perhaps in some vulnerable groups there's going to be. But Pakistan is the only country where the DHS not only finds out about registrations of births, but also adults who have ID, identity documents. And it's really interesting what happens there. Between, you know, adults get identity documents at the age of 18 between the age of 18 and the age of 40, there is a significant gender differential. Women get have IDs much less often than men. And I'll give you the percentages. Uh, the 84% the of people have IDs in Pakistan between the ages of 18 and 40. 91% of them are men. 
79% uh, of them are women. The differential, even when you control with it for a number of other variables, education, income levels, still women have a significantly less percentage point wise the capacity to have ID. So if you want to go to a universal system of ID registration in Pakistan, you have to focus on gender. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you will achieve full registration. And in fact, in parts of the country like Islamabad, y you know, there is no s gender differential because everybody is registered. Now, what is happening in Africa? In Africa, again, we analyzed, uh, and this is only birth registrations. In most countries, there is, again, no gender differentials in birth registrations, except for four or five countries. Some of them are pretty big. Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Gambia, girls get registered much less than boys. And the factors that seem to explain it or are correlated with it are not economic factors, they're cultural. One of the big determinants, not determinants, sorry, correlate, because we have yet to prove causation, is polygamy. Mm. In polygamy mm. households, girls get less registered than boys. And it is not economic differences. Mm. The income level matters very little. What matters really is culture. So again, if you want to address the issues of birth registration, you have to ad address demographic issues, gender mm. issues, and cultural issues. So let me end with something, and this is something that uh, at Data2x, we very much want to push for. There's this huge global movement to really get better CRVS statistics, right? Vital statistics. But the movement has been very influenced by the health sector in particular. So the movement is to really get statistics on births and deaths and causes of deaths, which obviously is very important. But I think that we have to take advantage of this international movement and at the local and also get much better statistics on marriage and divorce that are vital for everybody but particularly with women and we have to push uh, you know data systems and survey instruments like the dhs the mix that don't ask questions about marriage and divorce mm. you cannot d disaggregate in these survey documents you cannot disaggregate and see if women are married or in consensual unions, which is obviously, you know, significant not only for women, but for their children. Thank you. Myra, thank you very much. And let's just clarify a couple of acronyms for those who may not know. CRVS stands for? Civil Registration Vital Statistics. DHS stands for? For the Demographic and Health Survey. There you go, <laughs> lovely. Thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs> Alan Gell, um, you've been doing a lot of work on identification yeah and development here at mm. the center. And let's just acknowledge your co-author, Mariana Dahan from the World Bank. We're gonna hear from you later on. Uh, the paper that you guys co-authored is out there. I think a lot of you have got a copy of it. Um, and you've been working on identification and other specific STG targets that ID can help achieve. Mm -hmm. So what I'd love to know from you is what have you found about it? You know, what are the other targets? Mm -hmm. How can I, what about, what other efforts have you found around the world also to increase levels of identification? Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, uh, Rajesh. Um, you know, at the center, we started looking at this question of identification uh, about uh, five years ago, initially because of interest in cash transfers. How do you make cash transfers efficiently if you don't know who you're transferring money to? How do you use electronic mechanisms of transfer and so on? And then we began looking at it much more broadly to see where else it was being used. And so in 2013, uh, I wrote a paper <laughs> with a colleague, Julia Clark, who's no longer here. And we looked at 160 different programs that use biometric technology. This was a study of the use of biometric technology in development. It was called the Biometric Revolution. Because what we saw was that this technology was moving very rapidly into developing countries and is now very often the basis of these identification programs which are being implemented. And um, the perspective uh, you know, between um, identification and development, in this particular paper, um, all of the programs that we looked at 
Uh, a few of them were national ID type programs. Uh, many, some were for elections, some were for transfers, some were for managing the civil service payroll, uh, some were for medical insurance or health tracking. Um, so they kind of covered the board, some were for financial access and so on. So there was clearly a very wide range of programs that were being introduced uh, to uh, use ID for development related purposes. Uh, but what we also found was that, and by the way, about half of these programs were supported by donors. So donors are very important in this agenda, and donors have been important for quite a long time. But what we also found was that this was um, a very, very sort of sporadic and uncoordinated um, landscape. Uh, these programs were often you know, supported for a particular transfer program or emergency program, and then when the program stopped, there was nothing left behind. There was a voter roll. Millions and millions and millions have been spent on voter rolls. And the election comes, it finishes, and then there's nothing behind. And what people have is not really accepted for other purposes, identification. It's very wasteful. Also inefficient, no standards in these programs at all. Right, no, not clear whether they all worked very well. And so the SDGs, moving on from that, are really quite important for our work because mm. it allows us to think more systematically about how these programs and the underlying ICT technology um, can be employed in a more effective way to underpin development. Now, SDG 16.9, as you know, is um, legal identity, uh, including through birth registration. I'll get back to the framing of this in a second. In the paper with uh, Mariana, um, we identified at least 10 different SGDs. SDGs. <laughs> no. Uh, where, uh, uh, you know, an accurate knowledge of those involved was actually essential for uh, reaching the, the, the target. Uh, I don't think I can memorize going through 10, but in each of these 10 areas, there are examples which are in the paper of exactly how this works. They include financial inclusion, um, uh, uh, protection of, uh, of uh, women's rights and assertion of women's rights, um, transfers, disaster relief. Uh, what are some of the others, Mariana? Oh, anyway, well, a lot of them, anyway. There, there are a whole number over there. And even moving beyond these particular SDGs, if you think of some of the areas, for example, tourism. Tourism has been Africa's most rapidly expanding uh, export over the last several decades. Uh, there's increasing mobility between countries in Africa as people move between one and the other. You have the economic East African community, you have ECOWAS. How are people supposed to move between countries if they cannot be easily and clearly identified and processed through borders? So you can see many ways in which changes are occurring that are putting greater pressure on the need for accurate identification. Um, I want to briefly comment on three issues. Uh, one is the, the meaning of identity in the SDG goal. I think this is actually a very complex question, a very interesting question. And you know we're still puzzling over it, and I want to explain what we're doing. Then I want to talk about a little bit of what we're doing currently on, uh, on ID systems, looking at their capabilities, their structure, uh, what kind of services they do deliver or can deliver. And finally, just to flag a couple of areas of risks, uh, one or two of which have been mentioned already. First on the question of identity. I think it's very interesting that the SDG refers to uh, legal identity and uh, through including through birth registration. I think on birth registration, there is a reasonably clear picture of what we mean. We mean the registration of children at birth. The, you know, there's a debate, should it be one year? Should it be one day? Should it be five years? You know, How do you deal with children who are born and then die very shortly afterwards? These are all questions, but the concept is reasonably clear. When you get to legal identity, it's actually a lot more difficult because um, different countries have different identity systems. And the criteria, legal identity, for instance, many people think about it, it's very closely related to nationality and citizenship. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is a very well-established goal if you go back to the UN Convention on Human Rights, if you go back to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, you know, the right to a nationality is there. So it is very important for obvious reasons. But many of the identity-related programs that we see for development purposes do not involve nationality. 
And so we have to think a little bit differently about what do we mean by identity. In, in our work, we use the term official identity, meaning a possibly wider range. For example, the largest program in the world right now is India's Aadhaar program. 900 and, what is it, 30 million, 20 million people. That program does not provide any proof of nationality or of legal residence. It's an authentication mechanism against the database. So does it qualify as legal identity? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. There are currently about 12 states in the US, including the District of Columbia, who provide driver's licenses to undocumented immigrants, right? Those driver's licenses are legal identity from the perspective of being mm -hmm. allowed to drive, but they are not from the perspective of nationality. So you have to break these things out rather, rather carefully. And you know, this is one of the big questions facing countries, is how to phase the identity side versus all the other things that go with identity, such as nationality. It's a very interesting issue. Um, in our current work, we're looking at the um, the structures of different ID programs in the world. This is work Anna Giafassi is in the audience. And trying to understand how these different systems work. Um, you know, uh, for example, what about lifetime identity? Is there a clear relationship between birth registration and identity later in life? In some systems there is, in other systems there is not. Mm. Right? This is a very important question about lifetime identity. Are these programs, these identity systems, do they, uh, who has them, who, who has access, do they cost money? Uh, is it possible and easy to get them? But how are they used in programs? If they are used in programs, and if not, what are they lacking? So these are the kinds of questions that we're looking at systematically, country by country. And in some countries, you know, often countries need resources to strengthen birth registration and civil registration. No doubt about that. But often, there is a lot of money going into this area which is being used in ways that are not the most productive. So we're trying to look at efficiency issues as well. Briefly, let me just touch on the question of risks. Um, we know that this is not uh, a simple area and there can be unintended consequences of uh, uh, an approach which emphasizes this. One was mentioned before. What happens if, say, for poor people, identity is a barrier? as opposed to a facilitator, that's one. Another issue is nationality. There are large numbers of people whose nationality, either they are stateless or their nationality is not clear because it's not clear that they are legally entitled to the nationality of the countries they live in. Um, data can be misused, personal data can be misused. We're very conscious of that and we're looking at how data is being maintained and used and what the protections are. And finally, as I said, while there are many good examples of the use of this, there are also examples of wasteful deployment. Um, it can be procurement, misprocurement. It can be substandard or sub, uh, sub-sized programs. There are a whole range of issues. So we are very conscious of that. Um, just to end, I mean, I, when I first saw the evolution of the SDGs, I was actually quite uh, dismayed. <laughs> I thought to myself, my goodness, what a mess. Um, what, 169 or something like that? I mean, got it. Well, you know. <laughs> and I thought, well, this really is, you know, this really is a mess. But a as, I, as I thought about it, and in relation to this, I, I sort of now see it as more of an opportunity. Because what it allows you to do is it allows you to take some reasonably common aspirations and boil them down into some reasonably proximate, understandable targets that are the kind of things that development programs focus on. And certainly that's what I would like to see very much in terms of the discussion on identity systems and strengthening in the future. So thank you. Okay, Alan Gale, thank you very much. I'm just going to borrow a copy of your paper. One second, if I may. You forgot some of the other targets. Let me just read some of them out. Target oh yeah, 1.3, right. mm. implement appropriate social protection systems. Target 1.4, ensure that the poor and vulnerable have control over land and other forms of property, including financial assets. Uh, target 1.5, mm -hmm. uh, relief of flood victims. Uh, 5A, 5B, both within the gender equality goal. Target 12C, phase out harmful fuel subsidies. We're going to hear about that in a second. And it goes on, it goes on. At least 10 mentioned ten. in this paper that uh, Marianne and Adam have identified mm. as being aided, enabled by identification. Uh, let's hear more about financial inclusion and fuel subsidies. We're going to hear from a country that's also been working to improve legal registration, India. 
in the first year under Prime Minister Modi, used biometric technology to more than double the number of people with bank accounts to around 300 million now. It used ubiquitous mobile phone numbers uh, to know which people were customers of natural gas or LPG. And it made use of lower fuel prices to cut subsidies on LPG and use that money to make direct cash transfers to customers into those bank accounts. The system is called JAM, which is an acronym, stands for Jundan, which refers to bank accounts, ADA, which refers to identification, and mobile, the phones. Uh, identifying people was fundamental to this cash transfer system so that India would know who to pay the money to. It's the largest cash transfer system in the world. It's seen $2 billion distributed to 130 million people in six months. And identifying those people has brought them into the financial system. We're going to hear a bit more about how successful it's been in a few minutes. But a couple of months ago, India's Minister for Petroleum, Damendra Pradhan, who's implementing the system, came into CGD and we sat down to record a podcast interview with him. And we're going to show you an excerpt of it now. In a welfare state, in a developing economy, in a democracy, you have to take care of the poor man. You have to have the welfare policy. Subsidy is one of the strategy in a welfare state. But whom to give subsidy? How to give subsidy? How much you have to give subsidy? But also Th these are the challenges. And the subsidies in, are inherently in, inefficient as well. I don't believe so. Subsidy has to be there. But to whom? That's the challenge. Using this jam gateway, using the technology, we opt for the subsidy, not, the, not to cut the subsidy, to cut the leakages. Don't cut in the that way, cut in the that way, our primary estimate, we could save around 25% of our expenditure on the subsidy, what we have to do. So it's not an increase or a reduction in the subsidy. You're not cutting the subsidy, you're cutting the leakage. You yes, say. And that's, that's right. And you found that that saved you 25% of the actual annual cost of the subsidy. Yes. The cost of the subsidy is $8 billion a year. So you say you're saving $2 billion a year through this system. My strategy, my Prime Minister's vision is to enhance the LPG customer basket, not to the subsidy, not to the cut the burden, to give to the proper person. Subsidies should, should be there, but it has to reach to the proper person. And so this way, with this system, with the biometric identification, you can make sure the subsidy goes to the actual customer. Exactly, exactly. Um, now, this, the biometric identification system as well, how has that impacted the way people think about being involved in the government or governance? And how has it changed the way people actually behave? In biometrics management in India, we have some, uh, in primary days, we have some uh, disputes, we have some issues. But gradually, there is a consensus, biometric has to be there. There has to be an elect electronics identity system. It should be scientifically well proved that we have now achieved. Our 85 percent of our population is now identified in the biometrics. Yes, another 20 percent has to be added in the biometrics identity that we are going to do. And through biometrics, when you know who is who, what are the what is its background, what is its address, then only you can target at your benefits. Those who can entitle, the, those who are entitled, they must get that. Those who are not entitled, they must not get that, must not get that. These are the basic two, two strategies by the government. Did you think it makes people feel more empowered? Yes, yes. Biometrics make people more empowered. And how much has it cut down on corruption? We know that's a big problem in India. The, the way I told you, if I can say, save 25% of uh, drivers and in the LPG customer base, certainly biometrics and bank account, any kind of digitalization of the data is the way to eradicate the sub corruption in the lower level, corruption in the corruption from the system. Now in coming days, India will be linked to the optical fiber up to the village level. Real-time data will be reached to the village level. So this kind of network all the gradually all the government benefit and government payments and uh, ex payment by the citizens through the government system it will be through some gateway jam 
LPG uh, customer is not the only product. LPG subsidy is not the only subsidy. So many transactions, not only subsidy, so many transactions will be there through this jam gateway. Okay, let me just recap a couple of the main lines out of that clip for the interview for you. So he was saying that using the JAM system, biometric identification, India has managed to bring 130 million more people into the financial system. And that the, what they found by being able to identify the correct people to pay this money to was that they actually saved 25% of the cost of the subsidy system, $2 billion, because it wasn't being wasted or siphoned off uh, around the edges. Uh, he was saying that less corruption, uh, it, it leads to less corruption, and that as more and more people are identified, as the system is rolled out throughout uh, India's many hundreds of thousands of villages, uh, that they hope that they can use this biometric identification system linked to bank accounts via people's mobiles to actually uh, administer more government services in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get some comments on what the minister said. I want to call on Neeraj Mittal, who is a special advisor to the India Executive Director at the World Bank. Uh, Neeraj, sitting here on the front row, we've got a microphone for you. If you, if you mind just standing up, that would be great. Uh, and tell us a little bit about how exactly the JAM system has helped poor people get benefits in India. And I know there are some kind of question marks over whether it is as successful as the minister has been saying. As uh, Mohammed pointed out a story about Egypt uh, in a village, as economies are in developing countries moving from you know, village based to uh, more serious where migrations are happening, where people are moving from in, in search of uh, employment to better areas where governments are role of governments in providing social security, protections, uh, basic services, energy, subsidies for helping the poor are becoming important. The role of identity has also become very important. Uh, and, and, and this recognition is what has brought uh, the, this digital ID revolution in India, whereby we were able to, let me just start by you know, painting the scale of this problem. Uh, LPG is basically the propane and a butane combination which you get in here in petrol pumps. But in India, the bulk of uh, India's population, 67% uh, of the households use this fuel for their daily cooking needs, which means, and we deliver roughly 3 million LPG cylinders every day, which is roughly 1 billion cylinders a year. And every one of these cylinders used to have roughly 50% of the subsidy. And so when it moves in the supply chain, you simply find enough incentive to divert it. And this is what was at the core of the problem. And at one point of time, we also found that uh, people would have two or three connections in their houses just because we could not establish identity of a connection. Uh, and both these problems led to this solution whereby when the government started doing this, uh, the digital ID program, we were able to identify a connection with a unique identifier which is linked to the biometric ID. And so we had a subsidy burden of $20 billion every year. Uh, we started saving roughly 20% of this in one year, which will be you know, roughly about <coughs> two to $3 billion would be the subsidy burden we will save every year. Uh, just because we are able to eliminate roughly 40 million households, as somebody pointed out, um, uh, Mohammed pointed out the, in one of the countries where they were able to exclude host workers. So here we were able to exclude, well, not exclude, some self-selection people opted to stay out of the system. 40 million people out of the system who would want subsidies. It also helped in revenue buoyancy, which means it created fiscal space. Government, we started selling more commercial LPG, which was getting diverted from the, so government started getting more revenues, created fiscal space. Uh, for the poor who were unable to seek a voice and say, where is my cylinder gone? Because somebody has diverted it. A concomitant system, an IT system, whereby you can track your cylinders, also were created by use of this system. So people were able to enforce their rights. Uh, collateral benefits, externalities, they got bank accounts. So all these 1,440 million uh, connections which are now on the system, 
have bank accounts, which means this bank accounts they will now start using for other schemes, for you know loans, for financial access, for scholarships. Uh, the other thing they have got is the digital identity, which means now they can get access to, to services. They can aspire for more things. Unless you have an identity, you cannot even aspire for many things. So this has transformed the India's 140 million households completely and have empowered them, including the poor. Okay, Neeraj, thank you. Just pass the microphone to Mariana, who's sitting next to you. Mariana Dahan, Alan Gelb's co-author on the identification work that we published here at CGD. Uh, um, your colleague, Mahmoud here, gave us a little taster of the work that the World Bank is doing on this, the ID4D work. I'm just going to ask you for a couple of minutes just to give us a few more details about that. Thanks. Thank you so much, and thank you very much to uh, Mr. Muhyiddin, who is our champion, not only for the SDG agenda, but very recently now on ID4D, and we are very proud. Uh, because it's a new initiative at the bank, it was launched a year ago, and the difference that we are hoping to make is exactly what you've just mentioned, is how do we do to move in a more concerted and coordinated way, and how do you strive to that integration of different systems. We noticed uh, working with client countries that we have um, parallel systems being developed um, for different reasons. Many times it was simply because donors have supported different functional ID systems to mainstream those social programs in the most poor countries. Uh, and now there is a need for it to converge towards a unified system. So this is exactly what the World Bank is trying to do, helping these countries. We would like to provide technical assistance to the countries. We're already doing a couple of them, lending, supporting them with other financing options whenever <coughs> possible to bridge uh, that gap of financing that uh, oftentimes is observed. And also uh, raise awareness, advocate for uh, the need for everyone to have an ID. In fact, the leitmotiv of uh, ID for the agenda is making everyone count, provide an identity and digital ID enabled services to all. Thank you very much. Okay, Mariana, thanks very much. Let's kick off the discussion. Mahmoud Bokhialdin, did you want to make a point on that? Yeah, it's a very quick reaction to this observation, especially from the Indian exper experience. Well, th these problems of inefficiencies have been very well recognized. Um, any kind of report, basic report, about what's going wrong with subsidies and efficiency have been shown. Now basically, what made the difference here? Is it the leadership? Is it the recognition that you cannot go on like that? And what is the political economy that's surrounding it? Because when you mention and emphasize the $2 billion of savings, these were basically with some people who are benefiting from it, who are going to be resisting the change, even if they are not entitled to have them. They are going to be resisting the change. And here you need really to make it uh, with all of the kind of, of tools first to get those who are going to be benefiting from the reforms aware of it and to deal with these issues. It's not just the ghost workers in the case of Nigeria or the, beneficia uh, the beneficiaries of inefficiencies in India, but we have many other examples around that. The second observation, we are starting with 2.4 billion that we don't know anything about, but we have a flow as well of people who are coming into the system that we don't need really them to be added to the stock. And third, and finally just came from Europe, there is a very big issue of the refugee crisis. While there are many issues of humanitarian nature there, one of the issues that have been raised there is basically about identification. You need to identify those people. You need to make the identification secure. And th those people are not really cut from their home countries. So they are, at some stage, they are going to be, as little as they manage, they are going to be transferring money to their um, families in their home countries. So the issue of identification at a lower cost as much as we can is very much upon us with those hundreds of thousands who are in the shores of Europe. Right, I'm going to pick you up on that. That's an urgent problem. Yeah. What is the solution we can impl implement now to try and identify those people securely? Here it gets me into this issue that uh, Tony and others have, uh, and everybody emphasized that this issue of collaboration is very much needed because the problem is very much big there. And the solution that we can identify the problem, but the solution could be from the private sector. So who is solving the problem today of securing the mm. database of the refugees? It is not the official systems because they are not equipped to do that in Europe. But people like the um, credit cards, MasterCard, and Visa are coming with some solutions. So here, 
It's basically when you feel that we're an, a, a government-owned uh, organization. In the past, we felt that we can provide all solutions, but now the issues related to solutions have to come with the NGOs, with their innovative solutions, with the private sector practicality and experience in how to install fast, efficient systems of identification and make them uh, secure through their existing systems, and then to see who is going to be paying that cost because the private sector is not going to be coming there out of uh, uh, charitable uh, motivation. There are elements of that, but it's a costly business through which you need to have people like ourselves in the bank, other organizations, and governments to collaborate to help the private sector deliver. Just before I'm bringing in Tony Pipper, I just want to give a little plug. Uh, CGD has just issued a report on humanitarian cash transfers and mm -hmm. how to use biometric identification to do them securely. We're holding an event about that on Monday, so put a date in your diaries. Mm -hmm. Monday morning, 10 o'clock, right here. Come back for that event. Sure to be a sizzler. Tony Pipper. So I think, so, so I, I just wanted to, uh, to, to start to build on some of these points as well. I mean, I think so one of the things we got right in the SDGs, and it was great to hear Alan talk about it being an opportunity having those 169 targets, is that we did shine a spotlight on some very key things that in and of themselves are a bit unsexy. I mean, you have to say that 16.9 is, is not the thing that you would n you know, naturally have a whole um, constituency be drawn to to, to get everybody um, registered and to make sure that there's legal identity. But it, we were able to shine a spotlight and do it in a, in a concise, practical, and concrete manner for the importance of it. The, pro the difficulty here, and it comes a little bit to political economy, is that what we're just even looking at as the outcomes of some of these things we're talking about right now, the 130 million people coming into the financial system, the, the $2 billion saved, those were not, it was not just a program for getting people legal identity or registered. The, there are larger outcomes at play here. And so, you know, doing an initiative just around birth registration is gonna be yeah. something that's a little hard maybe to sell to the US Congress, but drawing it to a connection to what that can mean in terms of outcomes and how it can be integrated into development programs that they can have some specific outcomes like financial inclusion, like you know the vital statistics showing us where we are in health. That is important, but what that means is you have all these opportunities for fragmentation because it can be integrated into a program here, it can be integrated into a program here, and that, that, that necessity to think about it systematically that Alan was talking about and that need for coordination and collaboration that Mahmoud is talking about makes it really important because it's the enabler that becomes, it, it, what it enables in terms of outcomes that makes it so compelling versus just in and of itself, you know, what it means in terms of rights and, and access to services. Okay, let me change tack slightly with Myra. Uh, Myra, you said income matters very little. What matters is culture. So how do you change culture? Oh, if, you women can change are <laughs> if women are not being allowed to be registered or identified. You can change culture through income. <laughs> <laughs> Explain a bit more. A <laughs> but, you know, I mean, one of the things yeah. that works very well is getting women into the labor force. And once start women start getting money, that, you know, suddenly filters into the household and girls started being paid more attention, they get more food, they go to school, so there's a, there's a virtuous cycle. Mm. As there is vicious cycles, there are also virtuous cycles. So I think that empowering women economically is one of the ways that you're going to change culture. Mm -hmm. Alan. Okay. Yeah, actually, if I could add there, I think there are also some things that can be done to encourage women. In Pakistan, for example, one of the things that has been done, even though they're still lagging, is a women-only registration units. So uh, they will have units with uh, women drivers, female drivers, female registration, mm. uh, which helps to break down one of the barriers. In Indonesia, um, I had a very, uh, very nice visit to Indonesia with uh, Kate, the person you mentioned. And uh, we were out in the rural areas watching NGOs encourage registration. And these were female NGOs, uh, PECA, which is an NGO of female-headed households. And um, they were very effective in terms of 
going out, explaining to people why their children needed to be registered, what the, re the disadvantages were you know, for the future, and connecting with the women and encouraging registration. So I think there are ways in which one can approach this in terms of the design of policy and implementation. Okay. Yeah, Let's and if I just, you know, picking up mm. on that, I think that that is an incredible role that women's organizations okay. can and should play around the mm. world. Yeah. Mm. Let's open up to questions from the audience. What I'd like you to do, if you have a question, to put up your hand, uh, and then when the microphone comes to you, just say who you are and what your question is and whether it's targeted to a specific person. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, keep to questions as opposed to statements. Uh, and let's, uh, I think, sir, you had a question? Yeah, let's uh, get the microphone over to you first, and then we'll go to you, and then to you. Uh, thanks very much. I'm Steve Mosel with the National um, Capital Area um, UN Association. Um, you've described many positive um, opportunities that come from identity um, process. At the same time, several of you mentioned, well, there can be perverse consequences. Um, in the last year, it's been possible to identify there are over 50 countries now that target CSOs or NGOs mm. as groups that um, often carry out the very kind of thing that you're talking about. Um, but they're targeted um, with an expectation they'll identify their clients, they'll identify the local leaders, they'll identify people who could then be targeted by um, not very uh, supportive governments. Even our government requires that we identify all the players of every CSO at the very most local level in order to pass it on to the NSA to be able to track people and see if they're involved in development programs. It's a very serious problem. Could you talk a little bit about what are some ways that we could expect governments to give protection to participation in this process? Is there any kind of codification process or at least principles which might be discussed with governments as we try to implement this, I think, very important 16.9 um, process? But it, it has some perverse problems and uh, outcomes that we might need to strike in advance to really try to prevent, at least get a better understanding among governments that have the best of intents, uh, including our own. Okay, great. Let's pick up a couple okay. more questions and we'll get okay. to some answers. This gentleman and then this lady in the front row. Uh, hello. Yeah, my name is Raju Kusrekar. I work at the World Bank in the Identity and Access Management team, but it's for the internal use, not necessarily outside. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question regarding the comment you made about uh, what information that should be collected as part of the identity. And uh, the concern I have is the more information that you collect, uh, we all talked about uh, the benefits of uh, having this information, but especially for a developing country where uh, more information that you collect can mis misuse, and even in the advanced countries, that uh, you know that uh, fear remains. So, my uh, you know one question is like, uh, should this be done by the government? And the second would be, like, we if you if you allow others, like especially the private sector, to build s added services, added right on services that provides them that brings them in 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 the loop. And I'm not sure exactly how the Indian model was implemented, but I know. Like you mentioned about the legality of this identity, that there is a already a, an added service that they provide to sign digital signatures, and that's a separate function. So, so you can build a model uh, in a decentralized mode with with private sector being in in, mm. in the play. Okay, thank you. And then mm. we'll get this question from this lady here at the front. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Layla Magari. I, uh, I work with a gender, women, and democracy team at the National Democratic Institute. And this question is for Myra. Um, we're interested in legal IDs and the impact on voting, uh, specifically the lack of legal IDs and the impact on women's political participation and their voting rights. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on this aspect in terms of your new research, or if you focused on this in, in your new research. Thank you. Why don't we start with that question, Myra? Yeah, that's uh, I mean it's a very simple response. Yes, it's uh, and that's one of the reasons that I was so attracted when we decided to focus on CRVS, is because in the case of women, it really opens up the opportunity to have an individual identity, to get loans, to access the formal banking system, and to vote. Uh, but I, I don't think, you know, there's no information right now sort of on the links between having a legal identity and then, uh, and then getting registered to vote. That is the kind of information that we need to get. Yeah. 
Okay, then the previous question from Roger from the World Bank. I think this is for you, Alan. Um, the more information that is collected, the more it can be misused. Yes. So should governments be doing it, or is there a role yeah. for private contractors? What is that role? Okay, uh, you know, I think this is a really interesting question, and th it goes well beyond identity because, you know, data is being collected for all sorts of things. Electronic transactions, um, you know, in many countries, your, uh, your number plate is being registered as you move across different areas. Uh, so, there, you know, what about cell phones? Should cell phones be tapped? So this is a very general question, so I just want to talk about it from the perspective of identity. Um, I think, you know, the model, there are lots of different models of identity management, but one of the ones that is quite appealing is to collect the absolute minimum information for the purpose of identity that you need to collect. And let have, let have all the other information be in completely separate places where it is needed. So you have a very, very thin infrastructure of identification uh, and uh, you don't collect a great deal of data in one place. Um, if you take a look, for example, at how they deal with this in Estonia, it's a very interesting example, that's what they do. Um, they have a registration process, they take fingerprints. Uh, people identify themselves through a card, through electronic certificates and through PINs. And um, there is no other information in the system. Uh, so if you have health records, they're in a health record system. If you have uh, travel records, they are somewhere else. Then the main thing you have to worry about is, are these going to be linked through the common identifier? And that is a very, very serious question. And there, just to make a comment relating to the previous point, um, I think it is a concern that quite a lot of developing countries do not have data protection laws yet in, in place. Um, I think it's slightly over half do. And we have been looking at that in terms of the application. There's something called the Fair Information Principles of the OECD which provide a sort of conceptual basis for what a data protection system should look like. And one of, the, uh, one of the things that certainly I think needs to be done is that as donors work with countries to strengthen their systems, they also need to pay attention to that aspect of the system, to the legal aspect and also the capacity of the country, how it manages the data, uh, how it tries to keep data separate for different purposes. You know. And in some countries, I think there's a lot of progress. In other countries, frankly, it's going to be an uphill struggle. So when people mm. talk about, Alan, to follow up on this, more and better data for development, mm. the data revolution, mm. is the area of data protection being overlooked in that? Does it need to be part of that? Should there be more and better data protection as well? I think there certainly has to be more and, and better data protection in the sense that you know, there's a difference between data which can be pulled on an aggregate or an anonymized, in an anonymized way which gives you information about the population with certain characteristics. For example, if you use um, some of the data on firms, just to take an example, um, we want to get data on uh, individual firms in the US and there are these industrial census data. You may not be able to get data on an individual firm, you may be able to get it aggregated in terms of clusters of firms, so that you can't say too much about an individual firm that you can get on clusters, and similarly with populations. So you may not know, uh, and have an individual identified, but you will know about a population with certain types of characteristics, sometimes down to quite fine level. That would be an example of an anonymization uh, a process. And there are others too, for example, location, if you have, uh, geolocation in your data, uh, you may only get permission for fuzzy geolocation to be reflected. You don't know where exactly where they are, but you know that they're within a circle of a certain distance. So these are the kind of things you have to think about when you're thinking about the reporting of data on a disaggregated way. Mahmoud. Mm. Well, a couple of points. First, uh, on the issue of who's providing um, the improvements required for, for data, I think the, uh, the approach is regardless who's providing the data, be it public or private, there should be some adequate and effective regulations that through laws and through systems of, of supervision and, and, and monitoring. Mm -hmm. the, second, the second thing is basically we are, even in many countries, you see we are very much short of basic laws that are getting us into trouble whenever we are trying to improve uh, data systems. So, for instance, Freedom of Information Act. They are very much basic, basic laws, but many countries, 
either we have it just there to show that they have the laws, or they have it without any kind of application of them. And in these kind of laws, there is the right of the citizen uh, to know, and there is the obligation on governments to respond. This be, um, depends, of course, on the arrangement that they are doing. I, is it a supply-driven approach or a demand-driven uh, driven approach? This kind of, of work that we are trying to do in the bank of in encouraging uh, better identification, better, better targeting, is going to be having certain dynamics going forward. We are inc including all of those people in the system. There are many advantages, but there are many liabilities and responsibilities as well on the part of the government that they have to be very much aware of. And the kind of th these kind of dynamics, we need to get the not just governments, but societies um, uh, prepared to deal with. So the teams working on this area have been identifying <laughs> the different challenges. Some of them are legal, some of them are institutional, some of them are obviously technical, because these are not cheap systems. And when it comes as well to matters related to protection um, of data um, from abuse or manipulation, there are some, as mentioned by uh, uh, Prof uh, Dr. Gill, it's th they need really lots of investment in, uh, in the work going forward. So it's not really, while it, it looks very much promising, it looks like very much common sense, but the kind of costs and the kind of investments required are huge. Tony. Yeah, um, so in answer to your question directly, and I think you've, you've heard it um, uh, from several uh, on the panel, but where there's personally identifiable information that's at stake, yes, we need to be very sensitive and working on protection for that. And I do think within the data revolution there has been some sensitivity to that. But as we evolve and we get more serious and rigorous about what it might look like to, um, to do this work on legal identification and, and on birth registration, I think we have to continue to be as strong and rigorous about what the protection and systems are in place. But to, the, to answer the question also just about how governments might be using that personally identifiable uh, information, sometimes um, not in a positive way or a negative way. I mean, I build on what Mahmoud was saying to say that you have the rest of Goal 16, actually, and the targets within Goal 16 somewhat as a protection uh, of that because it talks about uh, effectiveness, accountability, transparency of institutions about access, public access to information. And so um, Freedom of Information Acts, yes, but also protecting the space for civil society, working through platforms like the Open Government Partnership, strengthening those platforms, being clear about what the indicators are that we look at to measure our progress on all of Goal 16 and not just legal identification and, and birth registration is as important and, and provides us I think some measure of comfort uh, if we try to make uh, try to make progress on all of those particular um, targets rather than just the one. I'm glad you picked up that third question, Tony. I was going to throw that to you anyway. <laughs> uh, let's pick up some more questions from the audience. Who else has a question? Uh, let's get this lady in the, the the pink shawl, and then there's this lady, and then this lady over here. <coughs> um, hi, I'm Sophia, and I'm an undergraduate student at GW. And I was wondering that you guys consider them the missing millions. However, do you think they're purposely forgotten by countries that, for example, don't want to mm. recognize such high percentage of poor people? As you said, these are often some of the poorest members of society. So do you think countries will want to recognize them and uh, like, you know, mm. put in their numbers that they have an increased population of poor people? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Sophie. And then who was the lady um, yep. here? Um, hi, I'm Nandini Uman, formerly at CGD. Uh, so I'm going to use my CGD alumni status to <laughs> ask two questions. Uh, one to the World Bank uh, folks about this whole issue of coordination. Um, I've been working on CRVS in Vietnam for the last four years, just come back to DC. Um, and uh, while it's easy to resort to that uh, sort of explanation of the problem as coordination, um, it's not just, I think, a process of coordination, but getting all the parts lined up. It sounds like in Vietnam, uh, while the, the um, uh, National Assembly mandated the judiciary, the, the judicial ministry to actually get this going, the Ministry of Justice had very little knowledge yeah. about the other components. So they're only sort of formulating the legal framework, but there's a lot else there that has to be put in place, including um, uh, the sort of actual systems building, which is uh, 
a component that clearly is not something that countries know exactly how to do. Uh, some countries are like Botswana, I think, has this uh, one population uh, platform. But I think that is something that is worth discussing in the implementation know-how um, and what the consequences are of each of the consumers and producers of that information. And then the other question was to Alan about um, this whole, I think, I don't know whether I'm mistaken or I'm seeing it more even at the government level, the sort of confusion between, or the, the lack of clarity between a unique ID versus birth registration and CRVS. And I think mm -hmm. uh, that really needs to be clarified because you, you need both uh, and you can't just have one without the other. So if you have unique ID, it's kind of useless without some of the other databases that you can link it to. So I think that would be an interesting um, mm -hmm. thought to hear. Okay. Hi, I'm Charlotte, and I'm also an undergraduate student um, in the School of International Service at American University. And my question for you is um, on the note of gender. Um, I'm wondering if there have been studies on, um, apart from the women's NGOs in Indonesia that are educating women about registering their children, especially their daughters, um, if there have been studies on short-term uh, incentive programs, like if you register your daughter at birth, she will have a guaranteed lifelong primary school education, mm. um, which then can, f you know, if, if women are educated that their daughters will go to school and have an income and bring it back home, it's like, like doubling the incentive. So mm. I'm just wondering if there's been any work in that and if you think that's something that um, could be part of this project in the future, and additionally, if you think that um, incentives would work better with uh, mothers and registering their daughters mm -hmm. um, in patriarchal societies and not just um, talking to mm -hmm. men and fathers. Let's work backwards again. Myra, do you want to take on that question first of all? I th you know, what needs to be done, uh, all these kinds of different incentives and other so sort of tweaks to the way that uh, birth registrations are done and legal identity given, and try to build some social experiments alongside with it to see wh which are the things that really work. And, and because right now, this the what are the determinants? I mean, we know, for instance, that educated women do tend to register the the their children much more than less educated women. But that is confounded because with, with teenage motherhood and whatever. So to try to figure out what works and what are the determinants, what, what will really sort of trigger the women to go, I think that social experiments is, is, is the time to start doing that. If you do do that research, come and tell us about it. Yeah. It sounds very interesting. Um, Alan, question to you from uh, Nandani there. Um, can you speak to the lack of clarity between yeah. birth registration and legal identification? Yeah, this is a really, really good question because uh, the birth registration and identification are often run together in a confusing way. And, um, you know, there are plenty of countries which have introduced identification programs with very low levels of birth registration. It's yeah. interesting, just to give an example, in the work that Anna and I are now doing on voter registration, in many countries, voter registration is much higher than birth registration, and certainly higher than past birth registration, which means that lots of people are being registered to vote who were never registered at birth as being citizens' rights. So what do countries do? Uh, they have to identify people for the purposes of programs or whatever, you know, so they weren't identified at birth, so they create a new baseline. They create a new baseline through all kinds of mechanisms. People vouch for them. Uh, they present evidence from various things, school attendance or testimony of religious leaders or whatever. And then they create an identity baseline. And that identity baseline is sometimes created at around the age of 18. And the, uh, you know, that is not a very satisfactory situation. On the other hand, um, the fact is that even birth registration as done today does not provide a very good baseline for legal identity. Several reasons. Uh, one is that birth certificates are very insecure. There is no standard form of birth certificates. There are something like 14,000 different types of birth certificates in the world. They're mostly paper-based documents. What do they work from an identification perspective on their own? Nothing. Right? Often you can't refer them back to registries because the registry is destroyed. 
even if you could secure, and some of them are starting now to introduce uh, digital certificates into the birth registrations, but then how do you know the person who's presenting it is actually the person who was supposed to have been born 30 years ago? So one of the conclusions that we're coming to in our work is that you do need birth registration, right? You need to start. But you also could benefit from extending your registration process right back down to the age of five because children of five are too young to commit identity theft. And India is doing this now with the Aadhaar program, which is, as it were, um, locking in an identity much earlier than is commonly done. So this is an ongoing issue, actually, and uh, it, it's a very important one. Okay, uh, Mahmoud? Right, and, uh, well, well, I totally agree with this issue of the coordination is not, not just the perspective and the notion, but what are we coordinating on? And of course, if you don't really have an effective counterpart, which is basically, if you have a country well organized together with the well identified objectives and good internal coordination, that makes the life of USAID, World Bank, UN system, NGOs easier. Um, actually, we are, fa we are normally challenged with cases that you don't really have this kind of basic internal coordination, and you may need to do that. And this is very sensitive because in the, if you are doing it, that doesn't really go well with countries that are emphasizing always uh, issues related to sovereignty and all, especially when it comes to getting into these issues related to identification and getting into the citizen surveys and all of that. The other, the other, so I, I totally agree with you. The other question about why we have this problem, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, is it because of, of governments uh, deliberately uh, are basically ignoring the problems? Who wants really to count the number of the sick or the illiterate or the poor unless they have really the capacity to, to deal with these issues? Um, that could be it. Uh, but it's basically you, your question better answered in a case specific uh, circumstances. If I have a country like the one I visited recently, uh, a post conflict country, and we ask about the number of population and you get a figure of 45 and another figure from an official 86 million. Well, 86 is coming really as a surprise as well. Why he's saying 86, not uh, 85 or 90? <laughs> because that great discrepancy is there, and basically, because for more than 20 years, they didn't really have a survey or a census or even a kind of a sample of what's happening in particular areas. So that would have its own problem because they were busy with other methods. The other thing that capacities, and this could be the more polite answer, that capacities in different countries, statistical authority, didn't really catch up with all of these things that we're talking about. The fast sure. urbanization, the formalization, the fact that if you are in a village, that you don't really need to really to be in touch with anything that's formal because you don't need it. Anything that you need, and even if you want to be identified, there is some person with that in, in that village can identify you much better than any kind of a sophisticated uh, a computer based kind of an answer. They know the origin, what you are eating, because you are living in a kind of a uh, almost perfect information kind of, uh, of environment. Yeah. And then I think the motivation happened then after that for, for other reasons that some governments started to see people as sources of revenue or, source or, or a resource when it comes to mobilizing them into some direction. But that is not really what we are after. It's not really that governments or states are really seeing people as objects to be mobilized. It's basically a citizen that they have to be accounted for because they are the, the first target of those SDGs as people. And, and here is basically the kind of different way. But we're taking it from the people's perspective, not from the state or government uh, perspective. If it happens that because of some, we have to be pragmatic as well, if your security system enable that to happen because everybody, as I have been in one country recently, they know who is there as a, na a national citizen or a resident or is coming for a few hours in transit or they there for, for days for security, for security reasons. But there are many benefits that you can really derive from that, but you need really to em uh, employ it in a better way for the service. But we have, as you can really see from all of these questions, we have a very big task um, ahead of us and especially that we have those targets by 2020 and by 2030, and now there is a monitoring mechanism if there is some seriousness on the part of governors and their partners to do that as well. So it's a very big thing. So it, I, I think it's actually a very difficult question as well when you start to peel the layers. So the MDGs taught us about the power of data and evidence. 
you know, it was one of the lessons we actually got out of the MDGs because that, that data and evidence allowed us to mobilize action in a much different way. I mean, when we saw we weren't making as much progress as we wanted to on preventable child deaths, it allowed countries to come together with, with, uh, with other stakeholders. U.S. doubled down its investments. India, Ethiopia took leadership roles. And we actually accelerated progress on those MDGs in many different countries. Um, and so, and the SDGs are in some respects a, a product of our belief that evidence and data is extremely important in helping us um, make progress on these particular areas. I mean, it's, it's what hap helped us add goal 16, for example, looking at the importance of peace, security, and effective and accountable institutions and what that means to the type of inclusive growth that then um, lifts people from extreme poverty. Uh, I mean, we're showing the integration. Um, but at the same time, we also highlighted the incredible amount of gaps that we have in our data. And that's a lot of what we're talking about today, and it's, it's what Data2x is about on, on gender. Um, and I think we have to uh, be sanguine as data gets better um, we might be learning some things that we're not making as much progress as we are. And that's going to be, uh, that's something that I think we have to be honest about and we have to understand how to get that narrative right. Because we should celebrate the fact that we're going to get better and when we look at fragile states and the amount of data that we don't have about what's happening in fragile and conflict affected states. Um, and if we're going to be serious about leaving no one behind, then we are going to really have to find a way to get that data and to get um, the birth registration and legal identity of, of folks in those particular areas. Um, but what that might show us over time can be, can, can, can complicate um, what we're thinking about in terms yeah. of development progress. And I think we have to be honest about that. And we have to be able to tell that story with the sort of nuance and not simplistic, um, are we doing well or aren't we doing well, but how do we take the lessons that that data, that that new data, and the, the better rigor of that data is teaching us? So are there political reasons that uh, governments mm. might not want Certainly. to identify some parts of their population? And if yes. so, what can international institutions and governments, the US, do about that? I mean, I think, uh, again, I think it's going to come back to um, uh, some of the work that we'll do um, on other parts of this particular goal, for example, I mentioned the Open Government Partnership earlier and, and ensuring that there is transparency, um, that governments are, are opening up their data um, so that, and that you're protecting the space for civil society to ask questions of accountability and citizens can be asking those questions. Um, are we really reaching everyone? Are we counting everyone? What about, you know, and, and I think, you know, other things that were, we're thinking about and we're involved uh, with others on, on the global partnership for data on mm -hmm. sustainable development. Mm -hmm. How do we use data that's not in official government systems? Um, and how do we leverage that? And how does that inform uh, what is being captured uh, in official statistics? And how does it raise questions and either affirm what we're learning through those official statistics or raise further questions? I mean, I think those are all efforts that we have to undertake and, and stay focused on for the next 15 years. Okay. We have run out of time, everybody. I just want to tell you about a couple of things. Um, if you haven't got a copy of the paper by Alan and Mariana, it's on our website, cgdev.org. Uh, if you are interested in the issue of biometric identification and how to help the poorest and most vulnerable, come to our event on Monday, <laughs> Refuge, uh, how to uh, cash transfer uh, humanitarian uh, relief. If you're interested in gender and development, uh, we will be co-hosting the Girls' Summit here on Thursday. Come along to that. And also, Myra will be speaking as part of the Women's Speaker Series on the... Si are you speaking of that? <laughs> well, I think it might be now. Um, on the 18th of... What month is this? November. Uh, come along to that. All details of that are on our website. Uh, I'd like just to get you now to thank our excellent panel who've given some really great thoughts this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, audience.